Hi, my name is JW, and this is my path to OSCP. It starts in the sun. November 2015, it's hot, it's dry. I'm walking on the street. I see palm trees, but I mostly see dust. There's leftover Halloween decorations on our neighbor's yard from two weeks ago. On the other side of the wall, there's cars racing past toward the airport. Yet, I can barely hear them over the beating of my heart. I'm very, very nervous as I'm about to do something very scary for the first time. I've never been as nervous as this as I'm trying to record my very first vlog that I will publish. I've written blog posts throughout the years, but this is the first time I'm pasting my face, my voice attached to my thoughts, making it more easy for other people to ridicule me or so I feel in my heart. And the reason for this is very simply, a few months earlier, I had found this um, community, a community that valued vulnerability as one of its key core concepts and tenets. So I was following suit. I was following this new peer group. But why did I have a peer group? or a new peer group. I had um, recently moved abroad. I was living in the capital of Saudi Arabia. I had moved there for information security, for a job opportunity in a new field for me. A few years earlier, Stuxnet hit. And before that moment when I heard about Stuxnet and how it had breached the virtual physical barrier. I was dead set on becoming the world's most awesomest developer or architect. For the past almost 15 years, I had honed my skills, grown my peer group and uh, socialized, gotten good at my craft. When I heard about Stuxnet, I knew I had to change paths. So I chose information security, but unfortunately I had no peers in that group. None of my friends were interested in uh, information security that much. Although thankfully the person, the friend who taught me the most I knew about web development had also instilled me in with a sense of security from the get go. But I got the opportunity to move abroad, to follow my passion with information security. And abroad, I had found a new peer group. And here I was recording my very first vlog. It was terrifying, but I managed to do it. And afterwards, I felt good about it. During my first year abroad, I had studied for CISP and broadened my knowledge vastly. But I wanted to get my hands on something more technical, something more hands-on. Um, CISP was very vast, but in the end, the exam was just multiple choice. And you could get lucky and get through it. And I wanted something different. So I was looking around. I found certified ethical hacker and, and so forth. And then I stumbled upon OSCP. And by all accounts, this was hardcore, at least on my scale. This was a grueling 24 hour long exam where you could not just go with multiple choice. You actually had to show your skills and be able to apply them under extreme time pressure. 
but this sounded good. I was glutton for punishment and I decided to go for it. And I decided to combine these two things. The vlog that I had accomplished three months earlier and this course because I wanted to document this for myself. I knew that this was going to be hard and I knew that I would be mentally exhausted every day. Um, so I wouldn't be able to rely on myself to write any sort of sensical blog posts about my all new discovered skills or struggles I faced. So recording a vlog or a video diary series seemed also like an easy choice, given it would be much faster to just record a small clip, upload it to YouTube and be done with it. And from the get go, I decided that I would not be doing any sort of editing, that I would be recording myself as raw as possible so that it would limit the overhead I would need for the actual vlog process. I wanted to sign up to OSCP labs or the penetration testing with Kali Linux labs early February. But unfortunately, there was a queue of some two to three weeks. And due to other real world um, plans, I could not get two months. Uh, so I was forced to do with either 30 day labs or postpone it until the end of summer. So I decided, what the hell, let's try. I mean, I didn't think how hard could it be. I was thinking, what, what, what's there to lose? Because I had zero peers. I mean, of course, I had my coworkers in our small company. But I didn't know anyone in InfoSec. No one in InfoSec knew me. And even though at times I could have felt well, no one cares about me and my, my journey. But I decided that I would rather think no one cares about me. No one, absolutely no one cares about this. So what the hell? Why not record it for myself? And if someone else finds it humorous or finds any sort of bits of learning from it, all the better. But no one cares. So what the hell? Let's do it. So I signed up for the course and it was a two week queue when I first recorded the first video. Based on what I read in reviews and other people's opinions of the labs, I figured that capture the flag contests would be a close substitute uh, to the actual penetration testing and auditing that was required. Me, with very little auditing skills or penetration testing skills, technical routine, or even knowledge of these tools, uh, others than what I had learned at the, at the workplace, decided to just go ahead and start hacking away. This very soon became apparent was not a good idea. This was very frustrating because I had no routine for actually starting to go through these puzzles. And of course, CTFs, Capture the Flag contests, are quite vastly different than actual live uh, real-world machines because these are made and created by people who actually want to be either smart about it or smart asses about it. Either are present and can be found in the same machine or the same puzzle. I did not have the time or patience because I only had two weeks uh, to become good enough to start the OSCP labs. So what I did was I decided to read up on some CTF uh, right, walkthroughs, write-ups about these CTFs to figure out what I was doing wrong. And very early on, as I was doing my second machine, I got from this site called Volnhub, 
which hosts these deliberately vulnerable, deliberately broken machine configurations that you can then try to break. On the second machine I was trying, I failed. And the reason why I failed, uh, which I learned from the walkthrough, was that it never occurred to me to try to log into this web service where the username and the password were the same thing. So let's say that there's the username Bob. Bob's password is Bob. And to me, that seemed very inelegant. That seemed very low bar. And in another machine, you were supposed to brute force things. Again, I was shrugging my shoulders and being all high and mighty about it that, ah, oh, this seems so inelegant. Like I was looking for finesse, looking for skills. And I guess Stuxnet had skewed my uh, viewpoint on this, but Stuxnet was a very weird aberration, not the norm of what happens in information security. And very early on in my labs, I had this foreshadowing quote in my video. Probably when you are in that moment, 16 hours awake, Red Bull fumes, banging your head on the wall on the same machine, you should have a process that you stick to. It became apparent and a running theme, uh, theme throughout my video series that I was very apt at finding these problems and figuring out the solution for them. That's a very good idea. But unfortunately, I did not have follow through on these. I wanted to be the wizard, the magical guy who just hacks all the way and hacks all the things and doesn't require brute force, doesn't require automation skills because I'm just that good. But of course, that wasn't the case. Nowhere near it. I had read that in the OSCP labs, or rather the exam, a certain tool called Metasploit is limited in its capabilities. There's usually like four to five machines and certain automated tasks you are able to use only on one of those machines. So even before my lab started, I was like, hey, because I can't use this on every single machine in the exam, let me limit myself and not use it at all during the labs because I don't want to rely on it. And several times during the CTF machines that I was trying, I was running, running, running and not paying attention. I noticed in one machine that I actually had the proper credentials on my screen. I was just so giddy. I was running through them and did not notice. So finally, after two weeks, labs. Labs start and I start going through the materials. On the second day of labs, I'm doing an exercise as they provide plenty of exercises. And mind you, this is um, five years ago now and they have renewed their materials. So I don't know what the current situation is. But back then it was 400 pages of PDFs and several hours of video tutorials and dozens and dozens of exercises that you were supposed to run in that lab network with tens and or dozens and dozens of machines. I think there's there was 30 to 50 machines when I was in the labs. On the second day, as I was going through the exercise, I nonchalantly looked at the video camera and was like, yeah, I was able to do this exercise and it worked. And I got this uh, super user, system user on this machine. Hey, good job. It was a nice exercise. Moving on. And half a week later, I'm all giddy and excited because I finally was able to get what's called a reverse shell. I was able to exploit 
the machine in a correct way for it to call home and be at my command. It would be quite a long while till I realized that that machine I got on the second day was equally correctly breached in my command. And I should have treated it as one of those machines. I should have looked through it, looked through it for clues for other machines and so forth, but I wasn't paying attention. I was too impressed with the materials. I was too giddy with excitement. And I was just, I was rushing through. On the second week, I was posting and saying that, hey, these guys posted this awesome uh, tutorial online, Metasploit Unleashed, for free. And I recommend to everyone that you should go read it before you start your labs. It contains all of these awesome tutorials. You get to know the tool. Um, you get to know all of these capabilities. So when you hit the labs, you can sort of hit the labs running. As if running was the point. And if only, again, I had heeded my own advice. I did not read through Metasploit Unleashed. And I, in very clear terms, also mention in my video that, oh yeah, by the way, I, I stopped reading through the material, the actual course material, because I found something interesting in my scans and I just started going through that rabbit hole. And again, this unfortunately becomes a recurring theme. Again, on several computers, several video logs, I'm fairly anxious, low energy, beaten on some days because I can't get any headway on these some machines. And then a few days later, I come back and like, oh God. The answer was right there in my scans, in my actual evidence, but I was just glossing over it and not paying attention. And not once, but on two different occasions during my one month of labs, I mentioned I should have a procedure. One time, for example, I, uh, this is a quote, I was so elated, I stopped following my own plan. I felt like, whoa, I'm a super powerful mega elite hacker cracker. I am not. I need to follow the procedure. I need to act like a professional, not like a script kitty high on Red Bull, even though I did drink Red Bull. And there was, again, this sort of mentality that as if I was this better than a script kitty, as if there's something wrong with actually using automated tools if it gets the job done. But this was my burden to bear. And as, why, as my labs was... Uh, Closing in on the first month, I was talking to two, two different co-students. Of course, I was talking to a lot of students, and a lot of students had noticed my videos and were asking for help on specific machines, which I could not help them on. But I was mentioning these two different students. One was a guy who was running his own CTFs before OSCP labs. He was actually building those CTFs and he was able to participate in the labs on his employer's dime. He had been doing two weeks at 14 hours a day, every day in the labs. And he had just finished getting the last machine in two weeks. I was like, 
Oh, shit. I'm nearing like I was a few days before the exam. And I had gotten like maybe two thirds of the machines. And I hadn't even seen the last network because the, the entire amount of servers was split into uh, a few different networks, uh, segments, groups. And then there was this other student who was also proud that they had finished and gotten their last machine of the labs. They were on their hundredth, 100, 100 day of the labs. And I have no idea where I stand on this scale from blasting in two weeks to being only ready at 100 days. And the pressure was getting onto me. And clock was ticking. The 1st of April was my exam date, and it was nearing. And I was gaining some followers, but I was too mentally exhausted to actually pay any heed that there were people watching. I did enjoy every single comment and every single time I was positively thrilled that someone cared enough to actually leave a positive comment. And that's all I got was support. Of course, questions about how to succeed and how to beat this specific machine and so forth, but mostly support. But I was spending 40 hours a week on work and 40 hours a week on labs. I did not have enough mental energy to pay attention to any sort of pressure coming from some sort of viewership. Then came the actual exam, 1st of April 2016, almost exactly five years ago. I made myself a schedule. You start here, you take a break, eat dinner, take a break, hack some more, take a break, go to sleep, breakfast, break, ready. I had some ideas of how to start hacking at those things. And I had this idea that um, because I was doing this video diary, I wanted to also capture the authentic exam experience. So I decided already beforehand that during these breaks, I would just record small snippets of how I was doing so that you could experience secondhand what, what the pressure felt like. When I started the exam, I was hopeful. It was sunny outside. It was nine o'clock local time. I had my lab access and I started all of these scans and was just waiting for the results. Four hours in, I was able to, after some, some head banging against the wall, able to get the first machine and I was gaining momentum. I was feeling good that maybe I could actually do this. Maybe I was closer to that two week guy instead of the hundred day guy. This was four hours in. Midnight, energy is starting to wane. In the past eight hours or so, I have made zero progress. There are certain types of, um, or rather there's a certain type of machine that anyone in the labs who joins the labs will know that there's a certain type of machine and all of my attempts to get that machine were failing. I was looking through my notes. I was rifling through the material. I was just flabbergasted. 
this um, game was beating me and I was not, not making any headway at any point. Three hours later at 3 a.m., very tired. Again, gotten some analysis of the machines, but no headway. Did not break into anything. Did not gain any sort of foothold. And I went to bed. I decided, okay, let me grab some shut eye and maybe in the morning things will look up. When I woke up, I was looking through my notes and that recurring three theme came back. I had missed things. I was running. I wasn't paying attention. I had credentials, usernames and passwords, information tidbits that would have been crucial. And within a few minutes of me starting again in the morning, I was able to gain some foothold. But the machines were built so that you would need to do a lot more hard work to actually get the full points for them. But I was too late. And this was my mood. This short clip describes quite perfectly how disappointed I was in myself. <sighs> 60 seconds until my lab ends. April 2nd, 2016 was the day I felt the most shame in my life, in my adult life. I felt so unworthy and being a self-taught IT and security professional Imposter syndrome had always been a devil on my shoulder. And here I had outed myself as the greatest imposter. I couldn't hack this exam. I was tired. I was exhausted. And I was really thinking hard whether I should be publishing this video, whether I should let, just let the earth swallow me. So what happened? I made a schedule. I did not follow it. I was rushing all over the place. I didn't have a checklist. I was feeling bad. And in addition, in addition to these, of course, I felt I was a disappointment to the people who were following me, who were mainly just random people, YouTube followers co-students, people I met online. But when I had recorded that final clip on that failure of a day, I realized that some of my local colleagues at work and some of the IT personnel at a client where I was serving part of my company, but I was serving as an information security professional. Some of these local people had mentioned they were following my videos and they were quite interested in taking the course. And here I was, should I be pressing that publish button? Would it be career suicide to actually do it? How would I face those people at the office after the weekend, after this disaster? I decided to post it and then just be away from keyboard for a few days. I had a planned vacation, so I knew that I would be coming back. But even before the vacation, I checked the comments that were flooding in from IRC, from YouTube comments, from email. 
and all of them were positive, supportive, there with me. Some thanked me for showing how hard this is. And once I had gotten a good night's sleep, I really did feel better. And I didn't feel so gloomy. Of course, that day had sucked. But that was the point of me videoing that entire day was to give that authentic experience. So what should I do for my second month of labs so that I could actually finish my path to OSCP? What should I learn? And hopefully someone else learn in my stead so they don't have to bang their heads on the wall. I was looking back and I noticed a pattern. I was rushing. And that to-do list that I mentioned on like the first week of CTFs, two weeks before I even started labs, one and a half months before I went to the exam, I never did that. Another one was, I didn't read the materials. I paid for the materials, but I didn't read them properly, thoroughly. And I missed clues because I was rushing. So did I actually succeed? Am I here just blabbing? Well, yes, I did. Mainly because I was paying attention. I walked instead of being always runny and giddy. And I made that to-do list. And to be honest, I was, in retrospect, happy I failed that first time and continued and posted that really shitty day. Because the up, the high of actually gaining that was all the more sweeter. And I received a lot of supportive feedback from people who had struggled mightily during the OSCP labs, that thank you for actually showing how damn difficult this is for us mere mortals. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do the video series, that it's not just, hey, I started OSCP. Did I get it? Yeah, there were some struggles, but yeah, I finally got it. That's an uninteresting story to me. And it's unrealistic. And it sets unrealistic expectations for people like me who do bang their heads against the wall for two days straight until they figure out they had the answer right under their noses. And I want to end this on a high note. Because overall, my path to OSCP was a good thing. And I'm happy I did it, even though there were painful bits. Yes! <laughs> oh. That was me going through and over that limit of being quite certain I had passed. And if I did not feel that lowest of low, that would be a much more dollar response. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, JV. It was a good talk <laughs> and uh, nice, nice slides. There was a comment that these were the was were the uh, weirdest slides in Helsinki <laughs> history, and I yep. can't ac agree that more. But at the same time, they are super awesome. So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, there is one question uh, about the. Uh, suggestions to students and career changes so first of all the uh the person who is asking this mm -hmm. is thanking you for the vlog 
Thanks. because uh, they got the huge confidence boost when they were changing the career and uh, they were following your vlog. So first of all, thank you for that. Well, that's and, awesome. Yeah. And uh, then uh, a question about that. Uh, would there be any other suggestions than watching your vlog for <laughs> students or career changers? Um, good question um to be honest i don't know uh when i was switching careers uh, i didn't know of i mean yes go through helsec virtual presentations go, go through the materials go through turkusek go through whatever these uh, uh, security conferences you can find in helsinki uh in in finland go through these local places, come hang, come join the matter most and so forth. When I was switching from development and ops to security, there was, at least I, if I recall correctly, there was no disobey. There definitely wasn't a HELSEC I was aware of. The only local InfoSec conference I knew of was T2, but that was quite exclusive given the very limited amount of tickets available each year. Um, and I definitely did not feel like I was belonging in that group of prestigious speakers and so forth. So I think that just Helsec being there and there being a peer group that you can just easily join over Mattermost is, is what I would recommend and wholeheartedly recommend just starting a blog and posting about how you're transitioning and your thought process and your struggles with it. And then posting it on Mattermost. And hey, hey, any comments, any thoughts? And you will find support there uh, that can help potentially guide you to InfoSec. Yeah, that is true. Also, the T2 is kind of expensive. So uh, if you're a student, uh, I, don't, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's, it's worth mm. of paying that money. But if you have an uh, employer was paying the bill it's definitely for were worth of the uh, of the uh, price yeah so uh another question uh we saw a lot of emojis on your presentation so Yaroneko is asking what's your favorite emoji <laughs> i would have to say either face bomber man uh, person shrugging how about the uh, llama <laughs> i'm not a big Alpaca or llama guy. No, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, another question from Yaroneko. Did you try harder and uh, how did it feel to you? Thanks for that prompt. Uh, that was actually one of, one of the uh, things I realized and was plugging about in, in my vlogs that uh, the thing about try harder is um, this psychology, uh, psychology trick called priming. When they say try harder... It makes your mind think hard, hard, difficult. You need to try more difficult things. But that's a red herring. Don't go in that rabbit hole. Try harder means try more things. Try to enumerate more. Step back and try, 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 try. Don't go deeper. Don't, do, don't go full matrix. Because I did that. Doesn't work. Just go through the next port and, and so forth. So yeah, I tried harder and uh, it, it got easier when I stopped being harder harder and banging my head on the wall. Yeah, I, I agree a lot about the enumeration stuff. Uh, it's I, I think it should be more like enumerate more <laughs> instead of try harder because uh, it's it's when, when people ask uh, hints for the OSCP certification exam, I always tell them that don't stop enumeration. If, if you feel that you are stuck, uh, go a few steps back and enumerate more yep. and you will get forward. Okay, so uh, next question. Um, okay, uh, there was no sound on the stream from uh, oh. for, uh, the clip, the video Damn. clip. So uh, they're asking, what did you say on the clip? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Damn. I was hoping that it would work. And so you missed the best part, which was me giggling uh, like a very excited person in the last one. Uh, in the first one, I just said, uh, after a very long sigh, 60 seconds left on my lab time. 
and <laughs> implying that this this was a failure. But yeah, just 60 seconds left in my lab time. Yeah, we will oh, add uh, exam. Yeah, we will add the sound to the uh, YouTube version. Okay, so awesome. We'll be there. Um, so, uh, what is the next headbanging you are about to embark upon? <laughs> well, uh, when I was doing the vlog series, I was dead set on like uh, reverse engineering and, and so forth. Uh, but then life got in the way and I ended up doing other things, more generalist security things. Right now, um, I think that my, uh, my calling is a little bit back to my roots and more to development. And I'm just trying to get to grips with the Rust programming language. Like in my, oh, cool. in my blog post from 2016, I wrote that I'm going to continue developing uh, or coding in Rust. I did not continue that for the next five years. <laughs> yep. Uh, but Rust sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, have you considered go back to recording Velux? Uh, I did a few times and, and yeah, I would consider it if i only had some sort of good concept uh, maybe a project uh, or maybe some sort of blog series i i don't see myself just recording a, a regular video and just explaining my thoughts um that still to the fin in me feels like presumptuous like why would anyone care even though i did mention earlier that no one cares which is a positive but still it would feel odd to just record my thoughts without any context so maybe if i had the correct project all right so maybe this is this is a forward question for <laughs> that when you are planning to do osce <laughs> um actually i decided against that uh mainly because I've earlier in my career decided that I want to be a generalist. And I felt that OSCE, uh, which is the next follow-up course, which is more about the exploitation of programs instead of this sort of penetration test of servers and, and networks, it would be going a bit too in-depth into that specific niche of information security. And even though getting those buffer overflows and those exploits running in the labs was a definite high. It's not appealing enough for me. Uh, it, it's a bit too in-depth for me. I would rather have coworkers, friends, peers that I know that are passionate for that. And I know that I can turn to them for advice. And I would rather stick to something more general and, uh, broader topic all righty um so um one question about the preparations for the mm -hmm. oscp uh the course uh you said that two weeks wasn't enough so how, how long would you suggest the preparation time should be before starting the labs like for uh average enthusiasts well that that was actually a question that was coming among coming up quite often i did try to answer that on 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 my website in my q a post which is a bit rambly uh, but that's so dependent on your background like are you a developer if so maybe it's easier for you to script things and uh, and craft those payloads craft those uh python code c codes and so forth that you need to do are you an administrator like a sysadmin then you would have a better grasp of how things are messed up in, in configurations, what are the common problems you face in uh, Active Directory and so forth. So it depends on your, your background. Uh, but I would say that like with the two weeks or a month of uh, preparation time, you can get warmed enough for the labs and I continue to be a proponent that you should grab like 30 plus 30 days instead of 60 days straight. Because 
every single time you extend your labs, you get another free exam attempt. And even if you're like mentally preparing, like I will do this in 60 days, having that exam in the middle will then show what you're missing. So you can then better equip yourself during the second 30 days. But two weeks to four weeks of like getting warmed up, reading lots of through like Metasploit Unleashed, going through uh, uh, walkthroughs of CTFs, and then actually replicating the steps exactly. Like grab some uh, Vulnhub, grab some walkthrough, and actually do every single step the author is doing and make sure you get the correct results. Then try different command switches and see how the uh, result like changes. Then see if you would have missed some clues if you had used the wrong commands, for example. And so I, I think that two to four weeks would be enough time to prep. Uh, there's no better prep for exam than actual lab time. All righty, all righty. And by the way, nowadays there is also the hack the box and there is like OSCP like boxes where which people have listed online. So there is like more tools to... Uh, to prepare yourself for the uh, for the exam and also to try hack me and uh, so on. So yeah. also the IPSEC guy is doing a lot of good videos, the wild truths about the hack the box boxes on the YouTube. So you should check them if you are planning to attend this. So so when you did this uh, OSCP, it was like <laughs> you are like OG <laughs> because <laughs> there was no that many uh, like uh, resources for doing that. So no, so. I, I basically read uh, high on cost coffee, gut milk, and uh, Rasta Mouse. Those were the OG guys that I was following. And uh, that specific thing that was maybe the most crucial for my passing of the OCP, that how-to, that checklist that I was missing for the first entire month, that's actually available on my website. I got it. I ran it through Offsec that can I actually post this? And they were like, yeah, that's cool. And it's it's a gist on GitHub and it's actually been forked like a hundred plus times by different people because they apparently have some use of it. Yep. Uh, would you recommend OSCP? Yes. Quite clearly, yes. Um, the attacker mentality is something that I really, truly grokked uh, basically s midway through my second month. Throughout my first month, I was like, yeah, I'm really getting this attacker mentality. No, I wasn't. I was surprising myself with things like persistence, like getting backdoors and adding users. Like this was surprising to me midway through my first month. But it wasn't until the second month as I was tackling this specific machine and I was battling it for two two days until I realized that, hey, I have root on this machine. I can actually just change the passwords of everyone and then log into their accounts. But the admin of me inside me was like, well, I, I can't change people's passwords. That's holy. I can't log in as other people. That would be like, I can't read their emails or files. That would be sacrilegious. And it took me until then to actually figure it out. And it did give me lots of good um, intuitions and, and skills for working as a shock analyst, as an incident responder and so forth, because I was doing the attacking. I knew how they would, how attackers work. Like if I got that sort of information, what I would do with it, how would I pivot inside the machine, get privilege escalation, how I would move in a Windows network and so forth. So even if you're going for a blue team role, even if you're a blue teamer right now, yes, go for this because that will expand your mind and it will make it easier for you to see which parts of your infrastructure are more critical to do, where you can find these evidences of uh, intrusions, where you need to put eyes on. If you're doing pen testing, if you're doing any sort of security related things, then yes, definitely. Yeah, I actually agree. Um, I'm a blue teamer, uh, forensicator by heart, and uh, I still consider OSCP really important and also other OS offensive security certifications as the more more you know about the red team stuff the easier is to analyze the blue team stuff than yeah. actions 
Yeah. Uh, well, this is not a question, but uh, Jaroneko said that uh, it, it, it's nowadays they are actually uh, uh, taking money out, out from uh, retakes, uh, the exam retake. So it's $150 per retake. So they, they don't offer free, free uh, vouchers anymore for. I mean, uh, at the. So the extension doesn't include the actual exam. Yeah. Attempt. yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, that was oh, different. Yeah. Like five five years ago, like you could pay a smaller amount for the just the exam retake, or you yeah. could pay a little bit more, get more lab time and the exam retake by default. So if that's changed, I think my recommendation still stands that you should have your exam fairly early on, even if you go for like three months have the exam at first month so you actually get the jitters out i know very few people at the time were passing oscp on the first go um, so it was more prone that you would fail on the first go so just get it out of your system document how it goes how it feels what what the situation is like so you can then pre better prepare yourself in the labs for that specific mentality because Even if you're taking your time for a hundred days and getting every single machine slowly, meticulously, that doesn't help you actually gaining four to five machines in 24 hours. That's a very different beast. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But thank you very much, uh, Jay Wee, for the Yive, for the talk. And uh, <laughs> um, hope we can see hopefully we will see you in in the future events as well this was your second talk in helsec and uh, thank you for coming uh, to us once again and hope to see you uh, in the future events and uh, now we will have few minute break before our next talk thank you Thanks.